In spite of the fact that a Trinitarian interpretation of Genesis 1.26 is supported by the immediate and broader context of Scripture, and was believed by many pre-Christian Jews and all the early Christians, a number of other views have come down the pike and are popular among anti-Trinitarians. Most of these views have gone the way of all the earth, but two are still with us and deserve a proper burial. The first view on offer is known as the plural of majesty, or royal we interpretation. On this view, when God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, he wasn't referring to his word and spirit, as one could surmise from the context, but to himself, much like the Queen of England, who famously quipped, we are not amused. But there are several problems with this interpretation. First, although this view is wildly popular, it's altogether rejected by Hebrew scholars as a viable explanation. While one could loosely use the phrase plural of majesty as a way of referring to the Bible's use of nouns like Elohim for God, which is technically plural in form but ordinarily functions as a singular, this isn't true when it comes to verbs and pronouns or certain participles in Hebrew, such as one finds in the underlying Hebrew text of Genesis 1.26, or companion texts like 3.22 and 11.7, where God likewise speaks in the plural. As the Encyclopedia of Hebrew Language and Linguistics states, the pluralis magistatus appears most frequently in nouns, but may also be used with some nominalized adjectives and some participles. There are no undisputed examples of a pronoun or a verb displaying the pluralis magistatus. Let us make man in our image has occasionally been explained as a pluralis magistatus, but comparative Semitic and contextual factors favor other explanations. As well, Gerhard Hazel, a professor of Old Testament at Andrews University, has also rightly pointed out there are no certain examples of plurals of majesty with either verbs or pronouns. The verb used in Genesis 1.26, asa, is never used with a plural of majesty. There is no linguistic or grammatical basis upon which the us can be considered a plural of majesty. Likewise, Klaus Westermann, who was a professor at the University of Heidelberg, said, The plural of majesty does not occur in Hebrew. So this older explanation has been completely abandoned today. Other standard reference works of Hebrew grammar and scholars of the Hebrew language could easily be quoted, such as H.F.W. Gesenius and Emil Rodiger. To a man, all reject the notion that the plural of majesty was a convention of speech or feature of the Hebrew language at the time Moses wrote the Torah. Second, even if, contrary to fact, the plural of majesty were a bona fide convention of speech in Hebrew, it still wouldn't fit the full range of occasions when God speaks this way. For example, Genesis 3.22 says, Behold, the man has become like one of us. If this were a true plural of majesty, it would simply say, like us, not like one of us. This phrase is discordant with a plural of majesty and stubbornly requires that we view it as a reference to more than one person. Similarly, a plural of majesty interpretation does not do justice to the obviously intended contrast found in Genesis 11.7. When the Lord said in Genesis 11.7, Come, let us go down and there confound their language, it was in response to the people gathered at Babel, who defiantly rebelled against God's command to fill the earth, who said to themselves in 11.4, Come, let us build for ourselves a city, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The come let us of the tower builders in verse 4 is obviously not a plural of majesty. By the same token, when this is met with the Lord saying, Come let us in verse 7, it's also not a plural of majesty. A final problem that deserves to be mentioned is one briefly stated by Taylor Lewis, a classical and biblical scholar. After mentioning several interpretations that people have come up with, Lewis first makes the same point as other scholars previously mentioned. Of all these views, the pluralis magistaticus has the least support. It is foreign to the usus loquendi of the earliest language. 
And then he goes on to make the following terse but significant comment, which exposes a problem that often goes undetected. He says, and it is degrading instead of honoring to deity. Lewis doesn't spell out what he means here. However, it's not hard to see why this would be the case. If God is only one and not both one and many, that is, one in being but subsisting in a rich diversity of attributes and persons in perfect unity, as in the Trinity, then speaking of him in the plural so as to make him appear majestic is actually a way of tacitly saying that he isn't really all that majestic. The underlying assumption of the plural of majesty is that words which betoken fullness, plentitude, or plurality bespeak majesty. And if such verbal concepts do not really correspond to what is true about God, then God is not majestic. The plural of majesty then, for all the aforementioned reasons, must be adjudged a royal failure. A second interpretation that enjoys widespread popularity among anti-Trinitarians is that God was speaking to the angels, seeking their help and counsel in the work of creation. If nothing else, this view doesn't try to write off the plurals of Genesis by means of a figure of speech, which is unattested in Biblical Hebrew, and recognizes that the language demands a plurality of personal subjects. However, those subjects most certainly cannot be angels or any other creature. The whole thrust of Genesis 1 is that the world and man are the creation of God, not multiple gods or angels as in various creation myths of the ancient Near East. While angels after their creation were spectators and joyful celebrants of certain aspects of God's created work, as we're told in Job 38, 7, Scripture always ascribes creation to God, never to extra deical beings like angels, that is, beings outside of the Godhead. Whenever Scripture speaks of man's creation, God is always the subject or agent. For example, three times in Genesis 1.27, the verse immediately following 1.26, it says, God created man, he created him, he created them. Genesis 5.1 speaks of the day when God created man. 5.2, he created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. 6.6, 6, he made man on the earth. 6.7, I will blot out man whom I have created. 9.6, he made man. Deuteronomy 4.32, you created man on the earth. Psalm 89.47, you have created all the sons of men. All such expressions simply and consistently state that God, never angels or other beings, made man. In addition to the fact that Scripture uniformly assigns creation to God, it also categorically states that God alone is creator. He alone has the power and prerogative to create, and no one else helped him in the work or served as his counselor, as we're told in places like Isaiah 40 and Job 38 through 41. The upshot of these passages is especially captured in Isaiah 44, 24. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. Accordingly, any view that ascribes creation to the angels or any other non-divine person who is external to the Godhead is a denial of biblical monotheism and obliterates the creator-creature distinction. And so, oddly enough, a view that is intended to displace a Trinitarian interpretation, which anti-Trinitarians routinely misrepresent as polytheistic, is itself, in principle, a capitulation to the very polytheism it pretends to oppose because it entails a plurality of entities outside of God who were co-creators with him. Another problem with the angelic interpretation is that Scripture repeatedly says that man was made in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 5.1, 5.3, 9.6. But by contrast, Scripture never says nor provides any grounds for inferring that angels also bear the image of God, such that they could, together with God, create man in their image. Indeed, while Scripture gives evidence that angels are rational and powerful creatures and that man has, for a time, been made lower than the angels, because man bears the image of God and as such is the apex of creation, he was destined to be exalted above the angels and crowned with glory and honor, as it says in Psalm 8. 
For these reasons, the angelic interpretation also must be rejected. There are other explanations people have come up with for the plurals in Genesis 1.26, 3.22, and 11.7, but none have been as persuasive, widespread, or long-lasting as these two. Nevertheless, as we've seen, for all of their persuasiveness and popularity among anti-Trinitarians, both of these views face insuperable problems being either contrary to the rules of Hebrew grammar or the theological context of Scripture. By contrast to this, as previously shown, a Trinitarian interpretation of Genesis 1.26 as well as 3.22 and 11.7 is consistent with the grammar as well as the immediate and broader context of the Bible. And these passages aren't alone. In the next video, we'll see further evidence from Genesis that God is multipersonal.